and then we'll go through the more of the gaming stuff. Um, the way that the hotkey test is broken up is that in Canvas, so we have to make sure that you can get into Canvas, obviously, before the test, you'll have um, the item here, so orbit view, and then you'll have a drop down where you would pick what is the hotkey from these specific items, what is orbit view. Then you'll have track pan, and then you'll pick from that list what is that hotkey. So that way it's kind of limiting as to where you could screw up. Um, if you know, like, go to last view is left bracket, then you should know that go to next view is right bracket, which you'll see, okay? The same thing with frame selected and frame all, you'll be able to see those two differences. Cool. All right, so some of these we've already gone through, orbit view, track, and dolly. So orbit, which is this, track, which is that, and then dolly, which is in and out. So we've, we've been doing that already, right? Um, go to last view. Now, some of these are, um, you'll see why they're more important as we go. Yes, 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 it's whatever. All right. So this is a character. So let's say that I'm working on the side of the character's head, and I want to, like, lock this view in. You know, I, I always want to work in this view, but I accidentally do that. Hitting Z does not undo that command. Using the left bracket would undo that move, okay? And then using the right bracket would get us back, okay? So those are very handy. You may not need them right now, but when we get into doing stuff more inside Maya where we're doing um, renderings and stuff, that will be incredibly helpful, okay? Uh, frame selected and frame all. So that should be a no-brainer. Hitting A is gonna frame everything inside your scene, whereas picking on a specific item like that would frame just that specific item. Uh, so that's navigation. Our viewport. So we can hit um, 4 on our viewport and switch to wireframe. So this is, again, something that can be extremely helpful for us, especially if we're trying to grab certain points. If I'm grabbing something on, let's say, the um, nose here, and I just, in this view, just do that, I may think that I only have the nose point selected, but if I go to wireframe mode, you can definitely see I've accidentally selected stuff in the back, and then I can control, which you'll see, deselect. There you go. Is there a way to turn that off? The wireframe? The, the, no, the, the oh, the background? The yeah, there's another way to turn that off. If we went to um, display, oops, let me go back to polygons. Display polygons. These are all the different ways that we can display the polygons. So that option is called back face culling, which will basically like if we're not facing that surface, it won't show us it. So if I turn on back face culling, you can see that the back of that head doesn't show up anymore. So now when I marquee and I grab those points, well, it still selects them, doesn't it? That's stupid. <laughs> um, I think it might be in here. Yep, camera-based selection. So that's the other one. So if I turn on camera-based selection, I think that would do it. Yep, there we go. So double-clicking the move tool allows us to turn on camera-based selection, which allows us not to do that. Um, so four is wireframe, five is shaded, six is textured. So there's five as shaded. Uh, so we can see the wireframe being filled in. And then six is going to be shaded. So right now you can't see anything on him. So I'm just going to add in, oops, I want that. That's fine. I'm going to add in a texture on top of him. We haven't really got into the textures yet in this class, but. So this is what he would look like in five because he has a texture on him. When I hit six, I can see that texture on him, OK? Um, and that's what that's going to show. So four, five, six, and then seven is our lighting. So right now we just have default lights in the scene. There's no actual lights. If I created a um, regular light, and again, we'll get more into these as we go. And then as I created that regular light, and then I forgot where I put it. There it is, right in front of the kneecap. Now I can see what the lighting is going to be doing inside the scene. Okay, so like in cinema, a lot of this stuff is just default. Like you make a material, you drop it on, it's just defaulted on. In Maya, you're allowed to turn it on, turn it off, because sometimes you'll have textures that just will kill your station having them all turned on. Okay, and same thing with lighting. Oops. 
so that's what those are, rough model, medium, and smooth. We discussed this before, so we'll just show it real quick. If you have a cube item, like so, oops, and I hit one, it's already in roughest mode. If I hit two, it's in half rough, half smooth. If I hit three, it's in full smooth. So again, one, two, three is, enables us to see um, the item at different resolutions. Now, we, regardless of how many one, two, or threes we've clicked, there's still the same amount of points, okay? So it doesn't actually change where the points are, it's just changing the preview of it. So that if I had a cube and I was like, I really want this to be smoothed out, I could hit three and it'll be smoothed out like that, okay? Typically when you work on a prop, you work at a lower resolution and then you can hit three and it'll smooth the entire thing out. When we go from Maya into Substance and we're painting textures, that's what Substance get is that low res, it gets this one in there, it doesn't get that one. So uh, Maya is if we were going to render inside Maya, we could hit three and it'll look like that. Um, standard full screen. So if you're a pro, you'll work, typically work like that. So you hide all your menus because you don't need all your menus. You want the biggest amount of work area as possible. So control space bar will turn those on, turn those off, right? Um, as you become more fluent in Maya, a lot of the stuff you'll customize on your own, um, especially people in industry um, they don't rely on any of these shelves here because they're just not very quick because you can only store so many up here and you still have to move your mouse all the way up to that shelf. Um, this shift right click where you can, you know, make uh, or you can select stuff from here, you can make one of those your own. Okay, so I can take all of my hotkeys that I, I, or all my shelf items I typically use and put them in what's called a marking menu, which is what that is so that I can very easily just shift click, grab what I need, and then you know, get out of there. Um, Alt-B, change your background color. It doesn't change what it renders like, it just changes your visibility. So in this mode, like that, the blue is kind of hard to see, especially on the projector, you can't even see. <laughs> so there, yeah, you change the background color. Um, all the colors in Maya are customizable, so I can make the background pink, I think, if I wanted to. Um, but that's just a good way to cycle that. Uh, jumping in and out of the view is tapping the space bar. So here we're looking at our perspective view. If I wanted to see all four views, I could just tap the space bar and then tap the space bar to get into another view. Okay, again, that's important to know because usually people will accidentally click it um, or some people really rely on this as their way to navigate from uh, side to side. Uh, menus, animation, polygon, surfaces, blah, blah, blah. So all these menus here, instead of going into this, you could just type in F2, oops, I hit F1, dang it. Ask me later what that is. Yes, close all tabs. F2, F3, F4, F5, and then it'll cycle through all of those things. Um, hotbox is holding spacebar. So if you hold the spacebar down, this will bring up the hotbox. So now any of those menu items that are up top here, for any of these things, you can access them through the space bar. And typically that's what people will do. Uh, even if they don't create their own marking menus, they'll use this. Because this is a lot quicker than me moving my mouse all the way up to the top and then trying to find that item or me switching menus here and then trying to find that item. Very easily I can just hold the space bar down and get it. The more you use this stuff, the more comfortable you're gonna be um, with it and you'll find these things a lot quicker. Your first time, holy cow, that's incredibly overwhelming. Second time, third time, eventually it gets easier. And then you realize, okay, this is all the dynamic stuff, this is all the um, animation stuff, this is rigging, this is modeling, and then this is rendering. So then you'll have a quicker idea of where things are at least located. Whoops. Um, control N, Control O, and Control S, new scene, open scene, and save scene, those should be pretty much the same from everything else you've ever used on a computer. Uh, we've gone through our move selection tools and all that. Um, make sure you're using these tools. So Q is a selection tool. So typically where you would use something like this. So let's say I need to grab points on this character's face. If I'm in the rotate tool and I click on one of the points, you can see how the rotate tool is now engulfing that. I can't grab any of the other points here because the stupid rotate tool, holy cow, what did I just do? <laughs> just click something. Uh, the rotate tool is like in the way of it, okay? So if I hit Q, 
then I can very more, much more easily go through and select points, right? Um, there's also, if I went to the move tool, sometimes the move tool will also get in the way and I can just hit Q and that way it's you know not in the way. All of these have options, okay? So they're all over here, so if you just double click on it, it will pull up the options for it. Or if you hold down that hotkey, so if I hold down Q and I left click, it'll bring up the options for that specific item. So something like paint select, incredibly useful. I can select you know, the whole eye cavity here much easier than trying to click on the points. Um, let's say I switch to faces, right? Very easily I can grab that and select those eye pieces. And that's good, okay. Um, select is Q, move is W, rotate is E, scale is R. Um, if I create a cube, there it is. All right, so now the next one, which is T, which is the show manipulator tool, this is the manipulator. The second I extruded that, I got a brand new tool, okay? They call it a universal manipulator, but that's what it is. It allows me to scale, move, and rotate all from one little device, okay? So if I accidentally deselect this, and I want to get that back because I want to change something, I can hit T and it'll automatically bring the last item back. Okay, if I have 50 extrudes on here, um, it won't bring all of them back, it just brings that last extrude. Okay, so just as an example, I extrude this, I extrude that, I extrude this edge or face. Okay, so there's all the different extrudes I did. <clears throat> I've deselected it. I hit T and it'll bring back that last one. Okay, now if I go over here to the history, all the other extrudes that I have are still listed there. So if I wanna go back to any one of those and show theirs, all I have to do is click on it and it'll bring that one up. And the reason we may wanna do this is because, let's say for instance, um, I don't know which one it was, let's say three, nope, four, One, yeah. So if I update one, I guess that's when it's gonna work. You can see how it's updating all the other ones too. So when I move one, it's remembering, okay, you moved one this far and then you moved two that far and off of two you pulled three and off of three you pulled four. It's updating that entire chain of them, not just the one, which is much better than me having to go through and try to grab the points and then move those points over. See, I forgot one because I have that camera based selection still on. And you guys told me to turn on, it's going off now. See, much better, okay. So that's what T will get you. There's also some, um, uh, some tools that have T as a like bonus tool. So something like a spotlight, here's my spotlight. I need to aim it at the character. So I can't get this to aim at the character and be up here at the same time because I'd have to like rotate it and that's difficult to do. If I hit T, it brings up a second manipulator. And that second manipulator, I can just point right to him and then boom, that's locked to him. So no matter where I move this, that light is gonna stay focused on that character. Sweet. Um, last tool used. Where is my cube, that is. All right, so here's my cube. I went in here and I did an insert edge loop there, there, and there, and then there, and there. I grabbed some points, I moved them up. I grabbed this and I extruded, and then did that. Okay, so now I wanna get back to my insert edge loop tool. That was the last tool that I used. Moving, yeah, the move tool is a tool, but it's not the same kind of tool, so just go with that. It's not a proper tool. Correct, it's not a proper tool. <laughs> okay, so ignore the move tool. Uh, extrude is an action, okay, because I hit extrude and that happens. The insert edge loop is a tool. So if I hit Y, oh, what? Maya, nope, Maya changed, they changed how they did it. Ignore everything I've said this entire semester, we're starting over. Um, apparently, extrude is now a tool, so uh, let me just extrude this down. All right. 
So if I insert edge loop tool and then I switch out of that, then I hit Y again, it takes me back to the insert edge loop tool. Okay? In the past, it did not do that. Someone should have got fired over that one. Uh, last tool uses Y. Yep, that's not a tool, whatever. Here's another one that people will get screwed up on. They come in and they say, hey, what happened to my move tool? Even bigger, right? So they'll say this move tool is huge. I can't see the arrows or my rotate. I can't even see rotate or my scale is huge. The plus sign and the minus sign on your keypad allow you to change the size of it. The bigger it is, the less sensitive it is. So if I go to a small size like this and I start scaling it, I, it's not even working because it's so small. There it is. It's super sensitive as I pull that out. As this is bigger and I pull it, you can see how much more sensitive it is. Sometimes you want to scale something just a hair or rotate it a hair or move it a hair, and that's why you would, why you would increase those. Um, usually, the more experienced Maya people, the screw with us beginner people, will make it big and then we just start crying when we see that. So That's what that is. Completing a tool is the enter key. Create. Uh, polygon sphere that works all right so I go in here and let's say I delete some faces gone and I need to um, append where is my append tool right there so the append tool works by me clicking on these edges now Maya does not know when I'm done appending edges until I hit the enter key okay so how do I get out of this tool I hit enter and I'm out of the tool it's completed the tool okay so that's what that means. Usually you'll see any of the tools you go into will pop up something here that says um, click the boundary edge. So you click it and then it says to finish press, press enter. Not every tool will say that but most of them will. Okay, So just be on the lookout for that. Uh, move pivot. We did that last time. Yes. What did we do last time? The stairs, right? We were controlling the stairs and that's what we changed the pivot on. So holding D moves the pivot. You can also rotate the pivot if you needed to in case you wanted to move it at a specific angle, which is, again, not something you use all the time, but for those specific instances where you need to do that, it's there for you. Um, you could also, just so you can see this too, if you tap D, that just puts you in the pivot mode. It doesn't take you out of it. Okay, I don't know how they figured that out. Like They must have a thing written like if you hold it for so long that it stays in and then lets go. But if you tap it, it's just there and back. Uh, attribute editor is control A. So remember, like the channel box, this is the channel box here. This lists the highlights of every object we have selected. The attribute editor shows us the guts of every single object that we have selected. Okay? Anything that's connected to that object will show us what uh, is connected. So this character here, this is a um, for the animation class. We have a motion capture connected in the back. We videotaped a guy moving around, and then we turn that into motion capture data. And so, if I didn't, I didn't save it, there we go. So if I hit play, you can see the animation. And it's hilarious in like three seconds. One, two, three. <laughs> Did he break his arm? He didn't break his arm. But motion capture, when you're using it off of a Kinect that's $30, is not the best. <laughs> it's pretty hilarious, though, right? <laughs> yeah. So everything that, I, that we did to that character to get him there is all part of this attribute editor and all part of this clustering of tabs at the very top. Okay? The more stuff you do to objects, the bigger that list is going to grow and the more tabs you're going to have. Um, so for this, anytime you create an object, you have skeleton joints inside here. Make sure I hit this view. You can see the joints are right there, and that's what actually moves the character around. Get in there. There we go. Um, it creates a skin cluster. It does this or original shape. It creates this tweak node, and then there's the material for it. Okay. So depending on what item you have created, it will do all of that stuff, right? So you just have to be aware that 
you may have to click this arrow a billion times if you have a billion things you're trying to get to at the very end. Typically what you're going to use this for is going to the attribute editor, which is easier to get to if you just right click and go to material attributes. It'll take you right to the material. That's typically where people go to the attribute editor to change stuff. Most of it, like I said before, you can use right inside here. Okay, until we get to like some more fancy stuff, then we'll start playing. Um, setting keyframes, we haven't really done anything with that yet inside here. Oh, great. <laughs> Wait, your crates are the same as the stairs? No, no, they're in the same file. Like, there's crates next to stairs. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's no problem. In case stairs are just like giant compared to <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right, so here, let's say that I need to set some keyframes. I'm going to go way past the animation. And I'm going to hit S to set a keyframe. And it, it sets keys for all this stuff. I can go up a little bit. That's actually a lot of it. What's that? Yeah, so it sets keys for the frames. Hello. <laughs> that's Wade. If you know Wade, that's what his arm does. <laughs> he does not have a clavicle, apparently. Uh, Maya does not do auto keys, right? So if you've had After Effects before, um, I think that's all that does it. I don't know if Premiere does it. Anyone use Premiere? No, whatever. Um, After Effects does auto keys. So you set it up one time saying, I'm setting keys. And After Effects will remember that you're setting keys along the way. Maya, you have to set it every single time. Um, for this class, we're going to be doing very minimal animations um, inside here. The biggest thing we're going to be doing is maybe animating some cameras moving around, and that will be the extent of it, okay, or, an, or a turntable item. Um, undo is not Control Z, it is just Z. What's Control Z again? It is also Undo, <laughs> but save yourself the keystroke. Just do the Z, okay? Uh, and avoid using these, right? Avoid using these undos. Avoid going to edit undo. The more you get used to using hotkeys, the easier life is. Uh, redo is shift Z. So if I wrote that down without putting the shift there, shift there, you would just see a capital Z. Maya differentiates between capitals and lowercase. So Z is to undo, shift Z is to redo. Okay. Uh, repeat action is G. So this is a neat one. Um, and people, you know, usually forget about it. Uh, why are you rotated? Uh, object. There we go. So let's say that I take this and I extrude it. Down like that. There we go. And I want to redo that extrude. We know that the extrude key is Control D to extrude again. Nope, sorry, Control E. I'm in a different program. Uh, we can extrude again, or I can just hit G. And G will just redo that last one. And again, the purpose of that is just it makes your life a bit easier. There's a key. It's the worst key in the world. OK, so repeat action is G. Now, I'm assuming since extrude is also being recognized as a tool, that I'm assuming that the multi-cut tool is also an action. What's yep, the it is. That puts the camera around whatever object you have selected? F. Um, control D is to duplicate, so Control D, there's another one, there's another one. Um, now you can do, uh, I don't have that on here, I don't think, no. Um, if I were to duplicate this and I want these to be iterate, it, I want them to iterate, I can't think of the past tense of that, or the future tense. So I can just move it and then hit Shift D. And what Shift D will do is it'll figure out how much did you move that past one, and then it'll automatically move the next one that same amount. So what we can do with that, not make these stupid keys. I'm going to get rid of Wade for a second. Bye. Goodbye, Brian. Bye, Brian. <laughs> All right, so there is this awesome model that I just built. And I put the pivot at the center point. I'm going to duplicate it. I'm going to scoot it up a smidge, and I'm going to rotate it. So what Maya will do is it'll remember you moved it up a smidge and you rotated it. So now I'm going to shift D. And see how amazing that is? Oh, so you shift D like a do it again button? Yeah, like a step and repeat, right? So Illustrator has that too. I think it's Control D in Illustrator, but Maya, it's shift D. Now, a fair warning, that does not work every time. <laughs> 
Just like everything in Maya, it doesn't work every time. So if I move it and I rotate it, I click off, I click back on, and I do Shift D, I've already gone too far. It doesn't remember what I did, okay? So then I would just simply just delete it and then just re-duplicate, move, rotate, and then Shift D again, and then it works fine, okay? Now, instead of me clicking Shift D a billion times, I can also go under Edit and go to Duplicate Special. And inside here, I can say I'm going to rotate each iteration 20 degrees and move each iteration up, I don't know, five. And then I want however many copies. And it'll automatically do all the copies at once without me having to do that, okay? Now, this is um, what we would typically do in the past. Now that we have MASH for this kind of thing, I would basically just use MASH for that, okay? So that's where we could duplicate something uh, like the, the barbs on the barbed wire, and we could just step and repeat that automatically. There we go, okay. So that is duplicate. Uh, grouping is control G. So the biggest windows that you're gonna use inside Maya are the outliner, the channel box, and the attribute editor. Those are the three big ones that you're going to use. Um, if, like I've said before, if you have a separate window, typically my outliner is on my separate window and my attribute editor is on the separate window too. The channel box is typically always docked because you constantly go to it. Um, at least referencing where these things are at because I want to lock them in, like let's say I rotate something. <clears throat> if I ever, ever, ever rotate this, I would never do this. How do you move the center X to the end? D. Okay, I would never do this and just try to eyeball trying to get that to 90. You're going to be there forever trying to get that exactly to 90. Okay, you'll see a snap in a second, but what I typically do is I'll do this. I'll go, okay, it's going in the negative, negative 90, and that will pop up there. So I'm constantly using a channel box to get those kinds of things set up. Um, or if I were to create this cube back at the default, how are you way over there? delete that and make a new one. There we go. If I want this cube to be sitting right on the ground, typically we do, um, I would move it up one, or sorry, 0.5 units in the Y direction, and now it's sitting perfectly on the ground, okay? So typically that's what I'm gonna use my channel box for. My attribute editor, I keep on that other screen um, because I t constantly go to that material attribute and tweak the materials of my stuff. <clears throat> There's a million things inside here that you can play with and do, and it's like super awesome stuff. Um, all of these little material, or these sliders here, they're right there, plus some other stuff. So I typically keep that on the other screen. Um, and then the outliner helps you see all the stuff that's inside it. So if you accidentally duplicate an item, I would know right away, hey, there's two cubes here, but I only see one, so I've done something. Okay, people get confused because they come over and they go, well, I'm grabbing this and I'm extruding it. But then when I click, there's only this cube. I can't grab that cube and this one at the same time, or they do that, you know. So just be aware that's why we use the outliner. Now, <clears throat> inside here, there's some stuff to also pay attention to. So let's say that I have these items let me change my background color, that's easier to look at. Okay, I have these items I want to all move together. Okay, so I want to move them together, I want to rotate them together, right? So I would do, just like we've done in other programs, just group them together. Grouping, fortunately, is the same thing as other programs, Control G. Cinema is Alt G, right? If anyone remembers, I think it's Alt G. Um, <clears throat> that was two classes ago, so we're already on this one. Um, so that groups them, and what it does is very similar to cinema. It makes a null object and drops everything inside the null object. Okay, that's exactly what it, it's going to do in every program. Um, so this is what's called the parent. That group one is called the parent, and all of these are the children of that parent. Okay, he's a single parent apparently. He has five kids. Poor guy. Um, we'll just call that poor guy. Or gal, right? So that's the parent, and then these are all the children. Okay, this one's going to go to Harvard probably, so he's whatever they write, everyone else. Um, so that's how we group stuff together. 
Now, <clears throat> we need to pay attention to that because Maya allows us to grab the group and move that around and the children and move them around as well. Now, we can have groups inside groups inside groups. If I go back to my um, mocap example, okay, the way that these joints get set up inside here is that the pelvis joint, which is right here, the hip joint, um, is the main parent. And all these other joints are parented to those, and that's how they all move together. So that when I come into here, and I grab this um, thigh joint, and I do that, that's why all of those things move together, because they're all parented together. Now, when I grab the knee, and I rotate the knee, the thigh shouldn't move, right? That doesn't make sense. Um, same thing with the foot. When I rotate the foot, the calf shouldn't move, and it doesn't, or the arms don't move, and they don't. Okay? So the way that Maya has it set up is that that is a, like, tree structure. I'm sure you've seen this kind of thing before if you've ever had Windows computers where you can click a little plus sign and it opens your stuff. That's what it's doing. So the hip is the main parent, and then the lower spine is the first child. And then from the lower spine, there's a mid spine, a chest, a neck, a head, and then ignore that effector head, but that's something else. Now, parented to the chest is the clavicle. Parented to the um, chest is the neck and the two clavicles. Parented to the middle spine, whoops, is the thigh and then that. Okay, so you can have a pretty detailed, organized structure as to how these things are set up. Typically, if you're going to model something that's mechanical and you want it to move the correct way, you will have things organized in a specific way so that it is set up like that. Let me jump to a new scene real quick just so you can see this. So let's say that I have a door right here. That's a trap door. There we go. And then we have a hinge on it. So we'll grab a quick cylinder. Uh, spoiler alert for a later hotkey. Holding down J after you've started rotating is your snap. So that will be up there in a second anyway. Right, so there we go. There's my trap door. Uh, it's not perfectly centered. Let's center it. Well, you're rotating, yes. Come on. Oh, yep, sorry. Before you start rotating. What's the program? Cinema is after. <clears throat> yep. All right, so like this, okay? So the way that this thing is set up is I want to be able to rotate this item, and then that's like the end of the chain. Then I want to rotate this item, and that's the middle. And I want to rotate this one, and that's the end. If I grab all three of these now and I rotate them, they do that. That's not how I want them to be set up. So I'm going to grab this, and then shift-click that, and I'm going to hit P to parent. Okay, Parenting is essentially like grouping, except it actually assigns that object to another object. Okay, so if you're familiar with After Effects, that's what it's doing is linking those two items together. So now when I grab this hinge and rotate, that door rotates. Okay, so then I'm going to grab this one and shift click it to there. And then I'm going to shift click this one to that one and parent, shift click this one, oops, this one to that one and parent, shift click this one, that one, and parent. Okay, so you're always grabbing the child first then grabbing the parent, and then hitting P. So if you think about it of what is going to move, uh, what's going to move everything, it's going to be this one. So that will be the very last thing I have selected. What will have the least effect on everything? This one. That will be the first thing I have selected, and I just work my way up the chain. Okay. So now if I were to grab this and rotate, oops, uh, it does that. Just ignore that for a half a second while I fix that. Modify freeze transformations. There we go, better. Okay, so if I rotate this, cool. If I take this and rotate it, cool. If I take this and rotate it, cool. By parenting. Parenting and grouping are very similar. With grouping, it puts everything under one node. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're also separate items. So it's all, it's all, it's like it's all together. Right, so this one, it's basically saying that when, when this item moves, I want this door to move. When this item moves, I want this to move. P, P to parent. Now, when I grab all three of these and I rotate, now we can get stuff like this. OK? 
okay? Because now what's happening is we're rotating each one of those parented items together. And if you're in the animation class, which none of you are, right? No. Nope. Nope, no apologies now. <laughs> um, oops. Then you would see that's one of our assignments is that we animate this little stick guy, and it's all done with parenting and how he's set up. Um, so that's grouping, that's parenting. To unparent something, you hit Shift P, okay? So if I wanted to take this guy out of the group, I would hold down Shift and I would hit P, and it would extract that guy out of the group. Same thing here, Shift P, and it unparents it, pulls it out of that group. So now there are three separate hinge plates all rotating separately. <clears throat> um, yes. Okay, um, object component mode. So, so far we've been going to right click and going to edges, vertices, faces, whatever. Uh, multi is a cool one too, if you haven't tried it, um, just ignore everyone this past next week and just play with this all week. So multi allows you to grab individual components, but it's not limited to just the one. So I can grab vertices, I can grab faces, or I can grab edges. So Maya will recognize what my mouse has hovered over and let me select any one of those items, which again, is extremely helpful. I don't have to go here, and then go here, and then go there, stupid. Um, I don't know if you've had this one yet, vertex face. It does that, look at that. It like breaks it up. You can't do anything with it, um, except look at it, I guess. Um, but you, I, can't, I can select stuff, it doesn't do anything. So I've never really found a use for that. There might be one. Um, usually people do it by accident. <clears throat> but anyway, what this is doing is taking that one object and putting it into component mode, allowing us to edit the individual components of it, very similar to like Cinema would do. F8 on your keyboard is the shortcut key that gets you into the mode for everything, okay? So for instance, let's say that I've grabbed all of these items here, and I uh, right-click and go to face. All right, hold on, let's try that again. I right click and go to face, there we go. Okay, so now it's only letting me select the faces on this one item that my mouse was hovered over while I went to F8. If I go, or I went to uh, face, if I grab them all again and hit F8, this is going to allow me to choose the different faces altogether. So I can grab any one of these faces from here because now it's basically grabbed them all and then showing the components for all of them, okay? Um, typically, if you've already gotten stuck, sometimes I'll tell you to hit F8 a couple times until it turns green or white, and now we're out of that component mode, okay? So F8 gets us into it. Now, how does it know what we want to select? Way up here at the top, when I hit F8, watch this button right here, okay? So you can see how it's toggling between these two. This is object mode, this is component mode. Um, this uh, little menu, watch when I hit F8 again, that's our selection mask. So this is again another powerful thing inside Maya that allows us to basically isolate what we want to select. So if I go over any one of these and right click, I can say I want to select poly vertices, or I can go to this one and say I want to grab faces, or go to this one and say I want to grab edges, okay? And there's like a million things inside here you may want to select. Um, sometimes you're working on a model, you don't want to select lights or, um, or joints or any of the other stuff, so in either of the modes, you can turn off, I don't want to select this or this or this. And it'll only select specific uh, kinds of items that you've selected, okay? Again, extremely helpful for being able to uh, maneuver around. So that's F8. Um, hide selected, show selected. So inside Maya, we've already seen there's a isolate item, right? We may just want to get rid of one specific area. I don't want to see this one. I can hit Control H, he goes away. I want to bring them back, I hit Shift H. Oops. I have to go find him first. There he is. Shift H. There we go. How do you open up the Window and then Outliner. Okay. So Control H will hide the item. In the Outliner, you'll see that it turns like a dimmed gray. I can click on it and hit Shift H and bring it back. Now, if you watch over here, if I take the visibility off, that's the same thing as me hiding it, okay? So if you rather type in zeros and ones to turn things on and turn things off, definitely you can just type it in there. Uh, Control-H, Shift-H is that. 
think that's all for that one. Yes. Painting. Oh, that's a fun one. All right, let's go to this here. So I believe maybe in this class, maybe in the other class I showed this, there are little um, things that we can bring into our scene. It wasn't in this class, it was the other one. That's the stuff you miss when you don't take animation class also. Um, I'm going to smooth this out. There we go, lots of divisions. And I'm going to go under my modeling menu under Mesh Tools Sculpt. Okay, so Maya has this um, tool that's called Artisan. And Artisan is basically anything where we're painting. So we can use this for sculpting or painting or selection or any of this kind of other stuff, okay? So changing the brush size, we would hold B and left mouse button drag. So let's say I want to sculpt the hand. I want to give this guy, he's got you know a pretty big tumor on the side of his arm right there. So we're going to go to sculpt. That's too big of a tumor. I'm not that mean. So I'm going to hold down, what does it say, right? B and then left, mil, left mouse button drag. So I hold B, left mouse button drag. Can you still use the brackets? Or? No, the brackets are not in here. The brackets are that, right? Wow. Last view, next view. Um, <clears throat> as I hold B and I drag, notice two things. Dang it. Um, I can't point to it because my fingers are on this. So there's a circle, that's the brush size, and then you see that line sticking up from it, okay? That's the maximum amount of displacement. Basically, it means how much it's going to move. So when I said he's going to get a huge tumor on his arm, that's a huge tumor. Watch. Oh. <laughs> oh, I think I yeah, he definitely needs to get that. I think he broke it in a skateboard accident. accident. Okay, so that's what the brush size will do. Maximum displacement, which is the next one, is M. So I will hold down M left click and drag, and then I can shrink that down. So now the maximum amount of movement is going to be much more subtle. So now, you know, it's bad, but it's not as bad as it was. You know, he can probably walk that off. Um, show wireframe, Alt A. Wait. Come on. Some of these hotkeys change from version to version. They like just get rid of stuff. I think because, show frozen, no. Steady, where's my wireframe? Oh, there it is. Alt A. Yep, they must have got rid of that hotkey. So um, ignore that hotkey. I'll just take that off the test and just give you the points for it. Because um, they apparently have changed that. And then reflection also. Where's my reflection? Symmetry right here. That should be Alt-R. Did they change that one too? They did. All right. So again, I'll take that one off the hockey list as well. That's not, they just change everything in Maya. Um, the symmetry mode is really good, especially if you have um, items that you're trying to keep symmetrical. That makes sense. Um, so here's the head. Whoa, there it is. So as I would sculpt the character over here, I'm going to make my brush bigger, make my maximum displacement bigger. As I start sculpting this cheek, I probably want the other cheek to be doing the same thing. So it's not a hotkey anymore, apparently. Nope, still not there. Um, so I would say, let's say object X, is that it? Yep. So now as I go in here and do this, you can see how it's going to be symmetrically moving those points around. Oh my gosh. Okay. And then double clicking on that tool will again allow you to edit the size still, the strength. Um, you can add a fall off to it. So right now my brush, even though we can't see it, it's strongest in the middle and then gradually tapers off. If I pull this straight up like this and straight up like that, it basically be like a square shape coming out of it. Let me smooth them out so we can see that better. Smooth. There we go. Lots of divisions. Holy cow. We'll go to the scope tool, we're on that. There you go. So that's what that's going to do versus what it was doing before. That's not what it was doing before, but it's a different look. A watery wave. There you go. So it's a little bit softer look there. You can also reset the curve. You can use some of these things. Depending on what you're trying to do, you can get different results. Um, there's also a Stylus, so if you have a tablet, you can control the pressure settings, which is super awesome. 
And then you can also have a stamp on here. Um, in this case, I'd have to import it and I have to find a picture. I think I might have a picture of, from my 2510 class, a monkey in a dress. Let's see what that does. Monkey in a dress, perfect. <laughs> there we go. So all this is doing is reading the black and white values, the brights, and that's what it's using. Um, you wouldn't typically use a monkey in a dress to, <laughs> to texture that. Um, I don't know you. But you can see how we're getting some sort of texture on top of this apart from just like a flat brush, okay? Um, there are whole things that we'll eventually get into where we see purposes for that. That's funny though. All right, so, uh, and that's that area. There's also a texture painting, wrong button, where we can go in here and assign a material to this. Yes, yes, there we go. Make our brush bigger. We can paint right on the surface. We can grab that texture. Where's my stamp? Stamp. Nope, I don't want that. Oh my gosh. That's that, yes. Set, blood paint. That. I have to load it, I guess, a different way. Um, typically, we never use this, okay? Um, the only reason I would use this inside Maya is just to kind of block things out that I would then use for something else later on. So let's say that in this character, I want to, to um, uh, put a, a uh, texture or something on his cheek, okay? Um, we can go into substance now, but for, pretend for like two seconds that we don't have substance. The UVs for this guy are pretty flat, right? They should be flat. They're like that. So I may not be able to see in here exactly where I want to see that. So what I can do is say, you know, I want to have the number 71 right there, boom. And then if I save this, yeah. it wants me to save the scene. Fine, I'll save my scene. There we go, then I can save my texture. And now if I go to my UVs, I'll see exactly where that 71 is. Then I could bring that image into Photoshop, put the correct 71 on there, and then I would be good, okay? Um, or if I had a bigger environment, I wanted to do some texturing in Photoshop or whatever, I could do that through that as well. Right? Um, you could also use it for, not specifically this class, but for painting other properties um, outside of that. So he has nothing, yes, he's nothing, okay. So let's say, for instance, I need to delete him, I need to make something smaller. Let's say, for instance, we have a sphere. And I believe I showed end cloth before this class, no? So I'm going to create end cloth, and I'm going to make a ground surface. So I'm just going to go to my nucleus and turn on use plane, and then hit play, and give us like a lot more frames. All right, there we go. So now it's going to fall and it's going to collide with the ground, and then just stay there. Okay. I'm going to go to the cloth shape and make this, let's say, silk. Okay. A silk shirt should just kind of fall and collapse onto itself and pretty much flatten out. Uh, I'm going to rewind this and like scale this down and bring this a lot closer. I mean, it's like way too big, maybe. There we go. It's still taking forever. Let's go here. I'm going to take the stretch resistance down, the compression resistance down. Bend angle, resistance. There it goes. Oh, a little bit more. All right. We'll just go crazy with this and just let it fall like that. Okay. So these properties are controlling what this shape looks like. <clears throat> so what I can do, maybe I put the mass is a little bit higher too, like let's say five. There we go. So what I can do is under those specific tools for the end cloth, um, I can go to Paint Properties by Vertex. Nope, I don't want that. I want End Cloth, Paint Properties by Vertex. And I can say Rigidity. 
Okay. So now instead of me painting actual like textures or actual um, sculpting on it, I'm painting a property for it. So that way, instead of the entire thing being the same amount of rigidity, uh, if I click the right buttons, let's try that again. There. Rigidity. Where'd you go? Thank you. Okay. So B, left mouse button drag. There we go. So I'm going to take the rigidity up to, um, I'm going to flood it first with black. And then I'm going to paint white. There it goes. Okay. So what this means is this is basically a multiplier. Where it's gray, I don't know why it's gray in those areas. It should be black. It must just be the display of this, I guess. Um, it's going to have basically no rigidity. And then in these areas, it's going to be very rigid. Okay. So just to do that, do that. Okay. So it's obvious. Uh, I don't think I should have to do that, do I? Let's find out. And that might have been why it wasn't flooding, because I didn't save it. Okay. So now let's rewind, let's hit play. Ah, epic fail. Uh, let's see, I'm going to go down to dynamic property maps. Well, it's reading it. Nope, it's not reading it. Should have saved, but it didn't save. Let's try that again. End uh, cloth, paint vertex properties, or paint texture properties, rigidity. Yep. Save this texture. All right, so now it's saved. I don't know why it didn't save before. Still don't want to play nice. Um, rigidity. Oh, uh, so rigidity is right now set to zero, okay? So it's a multiplier. So if I painted one on there and the value is already zero, it's going to take my one, multiply it times zero, and then what's the answer? Zero, okay? One, zero times anything is zero. So if I crank this up to 10, now you can see those areas that are very rigid, even though it's... Um, my texture was a nice smooth curve. There's not that many divisions in this, so it's only working on those points, okay? Um, but you get the idea. Sweet. And then I could obviously take that down further. Now this is called dynamics. So this is something where, like for some companies, that's a job is just doing dynamic stuff. And it's actually like one of my funnest things to do is just go in there and play with dynamics because just changing some properties and doing some um, some simple things really changes the entire look of it. It's pretty awesome. Um, while we're talking about dynamics real quick. All right, uh, snapping. So um, let's go to new scene. Let's create a cube. Okay, so I want to duplicate my cube, and I want to have it sitting right at the corner of this cube. Okay, so if I duplicate it and I try to move it, you know, it looks like it's snapped. It's definitely not snapped. It's like far away. So you may spend a few hours trying to line this up perfectly, and you may never get there where it's actually perfect lined up exactly where you want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, and I'm going to snap it so that it's aligned with that. Now, if I hold down V, which is the point snap, it would snap to points. So I grab this, and you'll see how it snaps right to those points. Now it's snapping center point to that point. So if I want to move this um, pivot here, I can hold down D and V, move the pivot, let go of D and V, just hold V, and then snap it right there. Okay. So this is, again, something that will help you out as you're modeling stuff. You may need something that is exactly lined up like that. Um, so V is snapping to point. C is snapping to curve. So let's say that I needed to snap this to this edge right here. I don't care where it is along the edge. I just want it somewhere on there. If I hold C, and this one throws people, I don't grab this at all, okay? You leave that guy alone. You just middle click and drag on that edge, and it'll slide along that edge. So now this thing is like locked right to that edge as I'm moving it. When I let go, then it's no longer snapping, and I can hold C and snap there. 
and then X is snapped to grid. So if I hold down X, I can snap to the grid lines out here. Okay, and depending on how many grid lines you have, will obviously control how many snaps you have available out there. Okay, so um, just three things that are typically going to be um, time savers for a huge time savers. Um, you can also snap things in just one direction. So if I shrink this like that, let's say perfect, and I want to snap this, um, let's say they want to snap, I wanted it here as far as the height goes, but I want to snap it over to the right. So if I hold down V and grab that arrow, it'll snap it just in that one direction. And if I spin around, hold V and grab it in this direction, it'll snap that way, okay? So you can isolate just the direction that each one of these pieces are snapping in much easier. You can also grab um, vertices or faces or points or whatever, and you can snap those in alignment with other things, okay? Um, don't let it fool you. Like if I click this and drag, sometimes that it's not gonna line up right away, but as long as you hold it down and drag over to it, you should be fine. Okay, so some X, C, and B. And B? V. And if you look at your um, keyboard, you'll see that they're right next to each other. And if you look at your keyboard, oops, that's it. Um, they actually look like what they snap to. So X looks like a grid line, it snaps to grid. C is curved, it snaps to curves. V is a point, it snaps to points, right? Looks like a pointer. So in this case, let's say I have a sphere like that, maybe not like that, like this. And I want to snap all of these things in alignment with each other. I can hold down V and snap like this. Oops, sorry, X and snap like this, and they'll snap to that grid line up here. Okay, so that snaps to that. I could also go to the options here, and if I um, turn off this keep spacing, it would actually flatten it out. Oh, I think I have still have symmetry on, it doesn't like that, there we go. Keep spacing is off, yes. No, it wanted me to do world, so I changed it to world um, moving, not object moving. And now it flattens that whole top piece out, which the reason for that um, could be that I want to keep this like that kind of shape. So it's more of like a hemisphere, nice and smooth, okay? So there's sometimes where you would want to use that snapper just to get everything lined up. Um, you may also use this, where is my content browser? So I modeled this character, I wanted to keep this symmetrical. Okay, in order to keep it symmetrical, this edge line has to be exactly on there. If so you remember from your drone um, or anything that you worked on in cinema or previously that you need to keep that center line um, exactly on the center line. If I move this away, if I try to mirror this and I say negative X, yes, and Maya doesn't do an awesome job at merging these, don't merge, there you go. Um, then we will have an opening here, okay? And then we may have to come in, I'm gonna undo that. Go to my top view, go to my vertices, or my edges, I can just go to that. And I may need to move, oops. I just have to deselect these edges along the bottom, there we go. I may need to move all of these and snap them right to that center grid. That way they're no longer pulled away, and that way when I do my mirroring, even with this off, I don't see any holes inside there. That's because I turned the merge off, just so I can show it. Once I turn that back on, oops, that should be gone. Okay, so we're modeling a car, we're modeling a product, something that's symmetrical. Typically we work on one side, and then flip it over and model the other side. Okay, um, so X looks like a grid, that's grid snapping. C is curvy, it's curve snapping, and then V is pointy. 
That's point snapping. And then here's what I was talking about before, transform snap, hold J, transform snap relative, hold shift J. So here's my cube. If I go to rotate the cube and I just do this, it's just free form rotating. If I hold J and rotate, hold J first and rotate, it will snap in 15 um, unit increments. If I, let's say, rotate it like this, and then I want to rotate that, I hold J, it will still snap to 15s, okay? But let's say for whatever reason, I want it like this, and then I want to rotate another one 15 degrees up, okay? That's where I would use Shift J as I rotate, and it just adds 15 to that one, okay? Now where that might be useful is if I duplicated this, and then use Shift J, and then use that Shift D. Okay, that way it's exactly where I put it. I've never had to use Shift J for that, uh, but it's important to see because whatever you're doing, if you're rotating it, it'll add 15 degrees to that. Um, and then it also works for moving. So if I hold down J for moving, it'll snap in one unit increments. Or if I'm scaling and I hold J, it'll snap in one unit increments. Now I guess in scaling, you may want to use the shift J just to add one to that, I guess. Okay, but for some of these, you know, I want you to see them because people use them. You, not may, you may never use all of these, but you'll definitely use most of these that are on this list, or you should. Uh, cool, anything else with hotkeys? Any questions on those? We'll take wherever you're at and just add 15 degrees. And then if I wanted to copy that and duplicate it? Shift D. You have to duplicate it first. Did you duplicate it first? So when you're doing that little trick, you just duplicate something and do a whatever rotation to it, or whatever, scale, movement. It'll do all of them. Right. Right, watch. So I take this piece, I duplicate, I move it, I rotate it, I scale it, and then without doing anything else, I hold down shift and hit D again. And then you're hitting shift D afterwards. Yeah. No? All right, we'll look at it later. All right. I wanted to do something like that. Uh, like that, looks, that looks pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, like I said, though, with the mash thing, it's not really, I mean, it's quicker this way, but whatever. All right. So I'm going to.